Hi, welcome to session 10 of World Revolutions. Today we're going to be looking at Vietnam. Now, Vietnam to most Americans signifies a war which the United States was directly involved in for a decade, was directly involved in the events unfolding in Vietnam for really two decades from the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s. And we're going to look a little bit at that uh, in the second half today in terms of the involvement of the United States. But that's really a secondary issue for us. What we're more concerned with here is, of course, what are the roots of revolution in Vietnam? What is the significance of this revolution? Uh, it is significant particularly because it comes to typify uh, third world revolutions in the second half of the 20th century. We're going to see a blending of both anti-colonialism, as a society that is actually under colonial rule at the time this revolutionary movement begins. It blends elements of nationalism and elements of social revolution based again on Marxist precepts. So we get a variety of different factors involved here, uh, but especially this issue of anti-colonialism, of fighting to throw off colonial rule. That is certainly the main focus of the early stages of the revolution and becomes an abiding concern of people in Vietnam. What we're going to see in the first half today as we look at the historical background that this concern with foreign domination and throwing off foreign domination and forming a nation of some type has a very long history in Vietnam uh, that stretches back uh, really two century, 2,000 years uh, in terms of the attempt to form a separate entity known as Vietnam uh, in Southeast Asia and to throw off uh, foreign domination which comes in a variety of forms both in this very early period and later in the 19th century with the coming of the French. But before we do all that, let's take a brief look at this map I have here, just so you get a sense of Vietnam. Uh, I guess it almost fits uh, on the screen. And this, of course, is Vietnam running along uh, this outer track here along uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, as you can see. And generally speaking, it is about here that one would normally distinguish between northern Vietnam and southern Vietnam. Uh, this becomes significant not only in the contemporary period when Vietnam was temporarily <coughs> divided uh, between north and south, but actually through much of its history there have been regional differences between north and south. As we will see, several different empires are created and initially those empires tend to focus in the northern part of Vietnam and then only later in the south as well. And one of the ongoing efforts of people in Vietnam down through the centuries has been to create a single unified nation or society uh, and that was a relatively long time in coming even though there are tremendous efforts made down through the centuries to resist foreign domination. And the key to foreign domination through most of China, most of China, most of Vietnam's early history is China. We see that Vietnam uh, is a border neighbor of China. And it is the Chinese who long dominate Vietnam and against whom the Vietnamese will fight to establish an independent society. And we'll see how that comes about as we trace these historical roots. Now, the Vietnamese people are technically a Mongolian people. They are part of the Mongolian tribes uh, that dominated the far northern reaches of uh, the Asian continent, eventually spread down through what is modern day China. So that is their direct ethnic historical route, if you will. However, through their early history, they were largely considered to be a part of the Chinese empire as it was first forming. Indeed, the first effort to form an independent society, an independent dynasty, uh, aside from what was forming in China at this time, was carried out by a Chinese general named Tru Da. In 208 BC, he led a rebellion uh, against his own Chinese masters in an effort to create a separate state called Nam Viet, which meant the southern Vietnamese. And what he meant by southern, this is actually occurring in the northern part of Vietnam that I just showed you. Why he would call it uh, the southern Vietnamese, it's because they are south of the main body of China itself. So there is this very early effort, two centuries before the birth of Christ, to actually create an independent Vietnam uh, carried out initially by a Chinese general. However, uh, that effort is very short-lived and Vietnam is quickly uh, absorbed into the expanding Chinese empire once again and becomes essentially a province of the Chinese empire. However, uh, this early effort marked only one of many attempts to assert Vietnamese independence. 
uh, the next key figures are two women, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters uh, were members of the Vietnamese nobility uh, who led a rebellion against Chinese rule uh, in around 40 AD, or the 40 Christian era, 40 years after the birth of Christ. Uh, the Trung sisters were uh, able military leaders who led armies against the Chinese and inflicted heavy losses upon the Chinese military. Uh, they become heroines in the history of Vietnam. Uh, it is alleged that one of them actually gave birth during one of the battles uh, against the Chinese, uh, slung the child on her back, and proceeded to lead her warriors forward. Uh, in the end, however, both of the sisters were defeated uh, by the Chinese army, and both of them committed suicide rather than face uh, the ignoble possibility of execution by the Chinese. So once again, we have here, uh, several hundred years before the first effort, a renewed effort to throw off Chinese rule. The third such effort comes under the leadership of another woman, Thru O, who in 248 led yet another rebellion. Uh, again, a young woman who was convinced that Vietnam deserved to be independent, deserved to create an independent dynasty of its own. She's looked upon as the Joan of Arc uh, of Vietnam, uh, a young maiden who event, again sacrificed her life uh, in the effort to throw off Chinese control. And she sacrificed it again by committing suicide after her efforts were defeated by the Chinese as well. So we have this tradition that begins to form very early on in Vietnam's history of struggle against foreign domination and specifically against China. Finally, uh, under this man, Din Bo Lin, an independent nation is created, we shouldn't really call it the nation, independent dynasty or empire if you want, uh, under Din Bo Lin, uh, this independent political entity is created that is technically independent of China but remains a tributary state, meaning that Vietnam must pay tribute to China, that Vietnam must remain in essence subordinated to China even though it is able to manage its own internal affairs. So this is a major step forward, but it doesn't completely by any means eliminate uh, the reality that Vietnam remains under China's authority in many different ways. Now, this particular set of events is followed by new invasions from China. Periodically, as new dynasties come forward uh, in China, they will seek once again to expand its borders and to undo, undo past understandings with border states. And this is what happened to Vietnam under Kublai Khan. Uh, if you remember, Kublai Khan is considered one of the great emperors of China. Uh, and under his leadership, he attempts to subordinate uh, the Vietnamese. He launches three major invasions involving hundreds of thousands of troops uh, to try to conquer uh, the Vietnamese Empire and draw it once again completely into uh, the Empire of China. His three invasions are all repulsed and defeated in the end. As a result, again, Ch Vietnam reinforces this tradition of struggling for its own independence against foreign domination. But there's another side to the Vietnamese reality, and that is that much of this struggle, as I mentioned earlier, was occurring in the northern half of what we now call Vietnam. If we look at this map again for just a second, much of what's been going on are struggles in this part of what becomes Vietnam in the end. This southern part of Vietnam was an independent empire known as Champa. Once the Vietnamese had thrown off Kublai Khan's three invasions, they turned to the task of expansion themselves and began an invasion of Champa and eventually conquered the southern half of uh, what we now call Vietnam and what was then known in 1471 as Champa. However, in doing so, in finally creating a unified empire by this conquest in 1471, the Vietnamese also severely weakened themselves and as a result were unable to resist yet another attack from China, in this case by the Ming Dynasty, you know, the successors to Kublai Khan. The Ming Dynasty is intent upon not only the conquest of Vietnam, but in making Vietnam a true Chinese province. 
And what does that mean? It means banning, for example, traditional Vietnamese dress. It means banning the teaching of the Vietnamese language. Instruction training was to go on in Chinese. Uh, essentially trying to ban the cultural aspects of Vietnamese society and impose Chinese culture in its place. Uh, this was a part of China's general effort. When we talked about the Chinese Revolution, we talked about the early Chinese empires, we talked about their effort to essentially unify their society, create a common language, common culture, common bureaucracy. The Ming set about the same task here in Vietnam, but this is coming much later than these earlier efforts elsewhere in China. And here in Vietnam, of course, there is this very long history of resisting outside control, resisting outside pressure. And the Ming efforts only exacerbate the opposition of the Vietnamese to Chinese rule because now the Chinese are trying to essentially transform them. Uh, eliminating the worship of their own gods, eliminating traditional dress and instruction in their own language. All of this deeply antagonizes the Vietnamese. As a result, an yet another rebellion erupts in Vietnam against the Chinese, uh, this time led by a man named Le Loi. He was a wealthy landowner who took advantage of the growing dissent within Vietnam against the Chinese and to lead this new uprising. He actually called himself, you know, the Prince of Pacification. And what he meant by that was that in order for there to be true peace in Vietnam, uh, they must eliminate Chinese control. And the deep-seated antagonism towards the Chinese provides him with a very substantial base of support through which to lead this rebellion. Finally, in 1426, he is able to uh, defeat the Chinese finally and establish an independent empire and create the Lur dynasty, uh, of which he is the first emperor. And this will become a centuries-long dynastic rule. Uh, this is a time when Vietnam really does have an extended period of independence under a single dynasty uh, that allows it to grow and develop significantly in the next several centuries. So this long struggle against the Chinese reaches a critical turning point uh, in the early 1400s with Lur Loi and his creation of the Lur dynasty. Uh, and this really establishes uh, a truly independent Vietnam and one that will not simply experience a few years or decades of independence. But this history of resistance uh, is an essential part of the culture and history of Vietnam itself. You can't really understand how Vietnam views the world uh, and particularly its closest and largest neighbor, China, without understanding this long history and how they would view attempts by other societies to impose their rule upon them. Now, what is Vietnam like under this system, under the Lur dynasty? Well, the emperors of Vietnam style themselves the little dragon emperors. That is because the emperors of China are considered the big dragon emperors. Uh, so they are, despite all of this antagonism and resistance uh, to Chinese control, nevertheless there is considerable influence, as we will see, in Vietnam uh, by the Chinese. Part of it is that there are a number of ethnic Chinese in Vietnam itself. After all of these uh, centuries of invasion, migration, etc., uh, there's a significant uh, ethnic Chinese population within Vietnam. And the reality is that China, despite its invasions and its attempt to to force its own ways upon Vietnam was in fact uh, a society worthy of emulation because it was one of the most advanced societies in the world down through these centuries. We looked at China, if you remember, and looked at uh, the rule of the mandarins, the bureaucrats, this fairly efficient bureaucratic system that China created, China's ability to unify its own population, etc. This was a society that had enormous accomplishments uh, in the cultural areas and administrative areas and military conquests. So it's not surprising that despite this long-standing antagonism, the Vietnamese would indeed, on, in many instances, imitate Chinese experience in creating their own empire. Indeed, the system in Vietnam is quite similar, particularly on the surface, uh, to China's when you look at the social makeup that you have as an elite landowners and a Mandarin class. There is a separate Vietnamese Mandarin class as there is a Chinese Mandarin class. And again, uh, what is their training? They're trained in Confucian classics. Uh, 
uh, and for the same purpose as they were in China, to provide a unified group of bureaucrats, people with a uniform uh, training, uh, with a common loyalty to the emperor, wherever they might serve within the empire, although this is a much smaller empire, obviously, in Vietnam. So that type of system has been adopted as well as it, the entire system of an elite based on large landowners. However, there are significant differences as well, particularly in terms of the peasant class. China and Vietnam are both essentially peasant societies where 90% of the population are peasants. However, Chinese peasants do not have the degree of independence, if you will, uh, certainly not over the centuries, that the Vietnamese peasants do. Uh, Vietnamese peasant villages are extremely strong social, economic, and indeed political units. If we look at the makeup of a Vietnamese village, it is essentially ruled, if you will, by elders, by a council of elders. These are people who are older, wiser members of the community. Uh, they hold discussions and debates on issues affecting the community. They are essentially its government, if you will. They do not simply act uh, on their own volition. They entertain the views and viewpoints of uh, the members of the village and would not think to violate uh, the basic will of the larger group within the village itself. There is uh, a strong tradition of communal land holdings. Uh, there are individual peasant holdings, of course, but there are also communal lands that are used. There is some redistribution of land as well. So there is a strong communal pattern, sharing up of resources within the village. Each village is also considered to have guiding spirits, that there are these spiritual entities who help guide and protect each village. This is in addition to uh, ideas of ancestor worship like the Chinese, the Vietnamese also believe in worship of their ancestors. And those ancestors are believed to be, again, directly tied and linked to the individual village. One of the reasons why people are so firmly attached to an individual village is that it is allegedly uh, the place of residence of their ancestors and the place where they can most appropriately worship those ancestors. So we have a variety of factors, uh, these elders' councils, the guiding spirits, communal land holdings, and ancestor worship that tie people closely to each other within these villages. They are very strong units, uh, socially, politically, and economically. And furthermore, the relationship between the peasant village and the large landowners uh, is significant because far more in Vietnam than in China, peasant villages held on to their own land. We do not see significant erosion of loss of land by peasants down through the centuries. Part of this may be explained by the relative instability in Vietnam. Remember, there is this long history of invasions from China, fighting off the Chinese, trying to create a dynasty, and as we'll see in a couple of minutes, even after the Lur dynasty is created, there is still a uh, fair amount of instability. So it was probably difficult down through the centuries for the landowning class uh, to experience a long period of stability where they could actively seek to encroach upon uh, peasant lands and reduce the peasants to tenants. Instead, well, there are large landowners. They are not on the order of the ones that we see in China. Instead, much of what they gain in terms of resources has to do with the collection of taxes, feudal dues, uh, from the peasants on behalf of the empire. So much of what the landlord gets is not peasants working on his land, working as tenants for him, but rather resources that he is empowered to take from the village in order to support the empire and, of course, support his own needs. But this means that you don't have nearly the control that a large landowner does over peasants who are simply tenants on his land whom, and whom he can remove at a moment's notice. The relationship between the landowners and peasants was frequently contentious. And the peasants did not hesitate to challenge a landowner who was trying to extract uh, unusually large amounts of wealth from their village. And this, in turn, uh, creates a certain triadal relationship between the emperor, the landowners, and the peasants. The peasants normally would appeal to the emperor's government through mandarins, etc., uh, 
uh, about the inequities imposed upon them by the local landlords. Now, the emperor, while he is obviously much closer in terms of status and power and wealth to the landed elite, uh, is not disinclined to respect and respond to many of these protests against the landed elite. As we've seen early on in the course, go back to the French Revolution, uh, the group that's usually the greatest challenge to a monarch in any monarchical system are the upper classes, the elites in a society. They're the ones that are likely to spark a rebellion, at least in earlier centuries. So it often behooves the monarch, uh, the emperor in this case, to try to limit their power, limit the power of the elites. And again, we saw this in France itself. Here, too, in Vietnam, uh, it behooves the Vietnamese emperors to pay attention to peasant protests because their protests and supporting their protests serves as a counterbalance to the power of the local elite. So we have this system that is a delicately balanced one between the elites, the emperor, and the peasantry. With the emperor, well, he must rely on the elites for governance, to assist in governance. Nevertheless, uh, being willing to entertain protests from the peasants because he wants to limit the power of the elites and not see them become so powerful that they can seriously challenge his rule. So again, this is another factor which uh, reinforces uh, a degree of independence on the part of the peasantry in Vietnam. And we will see that taking that independence away can have extremely grave consequences in the end for those who would attempt to rule Vietnam from the outside. These people have this very long history uh, of rule, uh, self-rule within the villages. And their ability, even with the emperor, uh, at times to essentially uh, disobey uh, orders that they feel will cause disruption within the village. In other words, an order comes down through a local mandarin, and the villages, well, they will feel compelled to uh, obey the most stringent and the most important orders, will at times fail to enforce those orders that they feel would cause disruption within the village. So we've got a good deal of independence on the part of peasants. Uh, it's not to say that they're not at the bottom of the power and economic rungs uh, on this ladder, but nevertheless, they do have considerable leeway to act to protect their own interests within this system. At the same time that these relationships exist, there is another reality, and that is that down through the centuries, despite the creation of the Lur dynasty, the dynastic rule of Vietnam was always problematical. There were inevitably challenges to the emperor's rule, even during several centuries of rule by the Lur emperors. And instability was a not uncommon reality in Vietnam in these centuries. Uh, periodically challenges to the dynasty. Vietnam at times was composed of three different uh, dynastic systems. Uh, this was always a problem for emperors in Vietnam, and that was maintaining stable rule. Uh, time and again, local elites managed to harness sufficient forces to challenge emperors and to try to diminish their power. So it is an uneasy relationship that exists here, and emperors are always sensitive to these challenges. And eventually, uh, that sensitivity and the degree of internal conflict will create an opening for foreigners to insert themselves into Vietnam's affairs and eventually subordinate uh, the emperors of Vietnam to foreign rule. How that comes about is not too difficult to explain and it comes from the West. In the 16th century, Westerners are already exploring uh, along the Pacific coast of the Asian continent and, of course, Southeast Asia. They are looking for opportunities for trade. You know, that's what Columbus was looking for originally. Long before Columbus, the uh, Portuguese had reached uh, Asia and had established trading outposts along the coasts of Africa and India and finally China and even Southeast Asia. In fact, in 1535, they create a port known as Phi Pho uh, on the Vietnamese coast. And Phi Pho would be roughly, just looking at the map again for a second, located about here okay, in the southern parts of Vietnam. So here was a trading post for the 
Portuguese Empire. Uh, but of course, the Portuguese are not interested in uh, conquest at this time. What they do is establish these outposts that are both military and trading outposts and try to develop a, what they hope will be a flourishing trade with Vietnam. So this is the early encounter between the Vietnamese and uh, Westerners, although it does not have a profound impact at this time. Uh, the Portuguese, as I said, are not interested in conquest. And furthermore, uh, they are not that anxious to try to spread uh, the Catholic religion, uh, which will become a, an issue of considerable concern over time in Vietnam. Uh, so their presence is there, although eventually they found that uh, trade in uh, Vietnam was not that prosperous and not that much their liking. They will eventually close down the port itself. But this is one of the early encounters. What is more significant over time, particularly by the 18th century, is that Westerners, uh, and especially the French, will begin establishing contacts with Vietnam for trade, and trade not just in traditional, traditional commercial goods, like silks, etc., but trade in weapons. Westerners see an opportunity here to open up Vietnamese society to gain influence within it by supplying weapons either to the dynasty or those who oppose it. So this becomes a, an avenue of uh, penetration for Westerners by involving themselves in these internal disputes, at least to the extent of supplying weapons to one faction or another. This, of course, only exacerbates the problems of unrest within Vietnam because now uh, both sides in these conflicts can call upon Western firepower, at least Western weapons, uh, to use on their enemies. So it actually exacerbates the level of conflict within Vietnam as a result of these uh, shipments of weapons. So Vietnam actually becomes less stable as a result of this encounter with the West because both sides are able to arm themselves more effectively. Now, by this time, no later than the 18th century, and even before that, really in the 17th century, uh, the French have begun sending missionaries to Vietnam with the idea of converting uh, the population to Catholicism, to Christianity. And they will uh, ply their efforts among both the merchant classes in the urban areas and also among peasants in the countryside. The extent of their success is always relatively limited, uh, much as in China uh, over these centuries. Uh, perhaps 10% of the Vietnamese population will eventually uh, turn to Christianity. It's not a very large percentage, by no means a majority uh, in this early period. A and Vietnam will never become a majority. Yeah, Catholic population will always be a very small fragment of the total. But it does raise serious concerns about stability again in Vietnam. The attitude of the emperors uh, towards this whole process is relatively ambiguous. They are ambivalent about uh, the question of Christianity because uh, on the one hand, getting along with Westerners meant at least some degree of trade. Furthermore, it was essential that the dynasty continue access to Western trade to secure weapons so it could defend itself against uh, possible challengers who would themselves, of course, seek out Western weapons as well. Now, if the Westerners are concerned about allowing Christian missionaries to operate within Vietnam, fine, it seems like a relatively small price to pay, at least initially, uh, allowing these missionaries to ply their trade uh, in Vietnam as long as it keeps the trade with the West going, and particularly the trade in weapons. Furthermore, uh, Vietnamese uh, religious practice was uh, fairly eclectic, much as uh, Chinese religious practice was. In other words, uh, there was a great mixing of different religious values and practices, uh, even within the same uh, group of people, the same family, the same individual. Uh, you're a Buddhist, you also engage in ancestor worship, there might be local deities that you uh, worshiped as well. So adding one more, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, we just call it Catholicism and uh, add their gods to the ones that we have. Uh, the problem will come over time uh, when Christians, uh, Christian missionaries want to insist, no, no, you don't understand. You see, you can't accept our God and the other 12 over in the temple there. There can be only one. 
Furthermore, that type of idea that there was a single God to which uh, everyone who would be converted would owe ultimate loyalty raised serious concerns uh, within the imperial system about loyalty to the emperor because other religious beliefs such as Confucianism always reinforced uh, the idea of the authority and legitimacy of the emperor. These Christian missionaries had no particular interest in supporting such an idea. In fact, since the emperor wasn't Christian, they had absolutely no intention of doing that whatsoever. So the emperors of this period, by the 17th, 18th century, are ambivalent about how they're going to treat the Christian missionaries. And there are periods when the missionaries are banned from Vietnam, and then uh, periods when they're permitted to re-enter Vietnam, just depending upon the individual emperor who is in power at that time, and how he perceives the relative risks and benefits of having Christian missionaries in Vietnam. These different issues of a Western presence, the question of Christian missionaries, and internal factionalism within Vietnam reach a crisis point at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. At the end of the 18th century, there had been, or I should say during the 18th century, there had been two contending dynasties, one in the north and one in the south, the Tron in the north and the Win in the south. Late in the 18th century, the Win dynasty was challenged by this rebellion, the Taeson Rebellion, between 1771 and 1786. And the dynasty was successfully overthrown bring an end uh, to this uh, period of dynastic rule in the South by the Win Empress. The last heir to the throne was this individual, Win An, who has fallen victim or seen his dynasty fall victim to the Taeson Rebellion and is seeking to reestablish his own dynastic rule in Vietnam. He turns to a French missionary, Monsignor Pignon, and Pignon makes the case for this young claimant to the throne uh, before the French king, before the French court, and wins for him support in his struggle. Eventually, as a result of French assistance, military assistance, Win An is able to overthrow his opponents and to reunify Vietnam once again as under the Lur dynasty. So in the early 19th century, we have a reunified Vietnam ruled by a single dynasty, and this is the Win dynasty. But how have they gotten there? Through French assistance. The French have played a major role in supplying weapons in military expeditions that made it possible for Win An to recapture uh, control of Vietnam and reassert his dynasty. Now, of course, there's a price to be paid for all of this. The French aren't doing this just out of the goodness of their hearts. They expect that, of course, if the Win dynasty has been reestablished and now controls all of Vietnam, thanks to French help, that the dynasty will open itself up to French influence in the form of merchants as well as missionaries. These missionaries, more than their predecessors, are extremely militant. Uh, they intend to truly Christianize the population of Vietnam and they will brook no interference or uh, resistance from local religious figures, from the mandarins, etc. So the dynasty is being put on the spot. They have debts to pay to the French, and yet the insistence by the French that missionaries have essentially an open avenue to operate on in Vietnam creates deep conflict within the country itself. Uh, people who are resisting these foreign influences and see them as a challenge to Vietnam's own culture. And again, remember how important these kinds of issues are in Vietnam. 
Vietnam had faced centuries upon centuries of Chinese invasion, attempts by the Chinese to change the culture of Vietnam, and now come the French with their own ideas about transforming Vietnam, this time into a westernized type of society. This uncertain alliance between the dynasty and the French quickly disintegrates during the first half of the 19th century. Incidents occur where the emperors strike out at the missionaries, arrest them, deport them, and the French, in turn, are going to send in military expeditions to punish the emperor, punish the Vietnamese for their treatment of French missionaries. The 1850s are marked by a series of such expeditions and outright military conflict between the French and, and between the Vietnamese and the French as a result of these incursions. Finally, under Napoleon III, the French send an expedition to actually seize and occupy Saigon, a major city, the major city in the southern part of Vietnam. Here, if we can go back to the map for a second. This is a contemporary map, so the winners got to name the places, and it's called Ho Chi Minh City now. But this is what was known as Saigon at the time, and here it is at the mouth of this great river delta, the Mekong River, a major port city, uh, the largest city in the south. And so this incursion uh, marks a significant acceleration of the French uh, invasion of Vietnam. And what is going on here is really an invasion. Uh, this is happening incrementally, but the fact is the French at this time are looking for new opportunities of empire. This is a time when European powers are engaged in a massive land grab, if you will, occupying most of Africa, parts of the Middle East, etc. They are imposing their will on China gradually, and Vietnam is another opportunity in this case for the French who have this long history of contact with Vietnam. So whether or not it is all entirely and deliberately planned, the fact is, as we look from the 1840s and 50s into the 1860s, there's this accelerating series of incidents, military incursions, and then this capture of Saigon in 1861 is a clear sign that the French are not just there to protect missionaries, they're there to establish a presence and even French dominance in the region, and not only in Vietnam, but in bordering states as well. The response of the Vietnamese uh, to this occupation is guerrilla warfare. Uh, they have used this tactic before against the Chinese hit and run attacks on superior military forces. They will turn to it once again against the French uh, and the forces that they have sent into Saigon uh, to occupy it. And the French incur significant losses, in part because they have a hard time becoming accustomed to the tropical climate, in part because these types of tactics are highly effective. Uh, anytime the French try to venture outside of Saigon itself, uh, they face uh, military attacks by guerrilla forces led by local mandarins, by the local uh, leaders of the imperial system. Finally, in 1874, under this emperor, there is an agreement to a French protectorate meaning that technically Vietnam remains independent, but it has come under the protective umbrella of the French government. Uh, this is a little bit like the situation where Vietnam uh, under China was a tributary state, that while well, yes, you still have uh, some degree of power and control within uh, your own country uh, as a dynasty, but the fact is many of your affairs are subject to French intervention and French control, particularly foreign affairs, foreign trade, etc. And the French have begun establishing military outposts in Vietnam, particularly in the south, uh, and essentially taking over segments of the country. So we have this incremental invasion again, and the declaration of a protectorate uh, is just a way of trying to maintain a fiction that there is still a fully independent Vietnam. And indeed, uh, the French, even once they've subordinated Vietnam entirely in the years ahead, and that will certainly happen uh, by the 1880s, even then they will try to maintain this fiction that somehow there is an independent Vietnam. They will continue to have an emperor, a Vietnamese emperor, uh, who they will appoint essentially uh, one after another, uh, 
throughout the second half of the 19th and into the first half of the 20th century uh, to make it appear as if, well, Vietnam is still an independent society. It's just that the French are there on this civilizing mission to help westernize them, help improve their standard of living, which had little to do with what they were really about. But the reality is that by the 1880s, Vietnam has really become a colony of the French Empire. And there is little that the imperial government can do about it. One last desperate effort to restore the old Vietnam, if you will, the Vietnam of the emperors, uh, comes in a rebellion led by the mandarins. And again, this is logical in the sense that they are the trained bureaucrats, they are the administrators of the imperial system, and seeing how the power of the emperor has disintegrated over the decades of French involvement, they hope to strike out against the French and bring down French rule. And for more than a decade, from 1885 to 1896, they will attempt to lead a rebellion. They are able to harass the French to some degree, but they are unable to rally the kinds of massive support necessary to defeat the French. The French clearly have superior military force in terms of arms, in terms of a trained uh, modern military, and the mandarins, to counteract that kind of size of force and uh, equipment, would need massive support from within the country. They are unable to secure that kind of support, and it becomes clear from this rebellion at the end of the 19th century that if the French are ever to be driven out, it will take a mass rebellion within Vietnam itself. And millions of people will have to turn against the French to try to oust them from power. Uh, but that will not come for several decades after the failed Mandarin Rebellion of the 1880s and 1890s. Now, what do the French actually do with Vietnam, if you will? Well, as with every colony, the French are anxious to uh, establish the fact that this will be a paying proposition. One of the harsh realities that uh, European colon colonial powers discovered was that creating empire, creating colonies, was an expensive proposition and that many colonies did not pay for themselves. That imposing foreign rule, bringing over a military force, bringing over bureaucrats, uh, became an extremely expensive proposition and often cost the government far more money than it could hope to secure from the colony. As a result, the French set about trying to create conditions which will allow Vietnam to pay for itself as a colony so that the French can actually prosper from the situation. And the key to that is to create an export economy. Now, Vietnam was essentially, as we have seen, a peasant society with a peasant subsistence economy. The main economic activity was the growing of rice and other agricultural products in Vietnam, and the use of those products internally within the country itself. To some degree, some of this was siphoned off through tribute, through taxes, and by the imperial government, and there were small amounts of exports of rice and other products. Obviously, there was a basis for trade with the French uh, down through the centuries. But the main focus was on domestic production of goods for domestic consumption. Now, the French want to change all of that. They want to, Vietnam to become a major export of products so those exports can help pay for French rule. This will mean particularly the export of rice and rubber and the creation of an agricultural system, agricultural institutions that will allow massive production of such products. For the creation of a rice-based export economy, the French will have to set about creating a new landowning class. Remember, the principal components of agrarian society in Vietnam down through the centuries was one, peasant villages, which controlled most of the land, particularly in communal fashion, and grew subsistence products. And then a landowning elite that essentially served as a mechanism for gathering taxes and tribute from the peasants. This kind of system has very little emphasis on commercial production of agricultural products. So there needs to be a new landowning elite people who are more entrepreneurial, who will commercialize 
agriculture. For that purpose, the French draw up new laws governing land ownership that now make it possible for people to buy substantial portions of land in the countryside, something that was largely unheard of in the earlier centuries because, of course, land passed down from one generation to another in the village. Now, urban dwellers, particularly merchants, and to some degree the old Mandarin class, people with money, are going to be able to purchase land out in the countryside and to develop agricultural estates that can produce rice at a level that will allow for export. This process begins under French rule and is particularly effective in the southern half of Vietnam. Uh, the reason for that, again, we need to look back at this map. When we look at Vietnam, and I've talked about the fact that we, there were often times when Vietnam was really two separate empires, and times indeed there were three within Vietnam, but more than that, there is another division between North and South that has to do with terrain, has to do with geography. The northern part of Vietnam tends to be marked, particularly in the far north up here, uh, by mountainous areas. And even down here, we do not have a lot of open plain. We tend to have more rugged area with river valleys. Uh, and when we oppose that to the southern part of Vietnam, here, particularly in the southernmost region, we have large areas of flat terrain, uh, areas that are watered by the Mekong and its tributaries. So here in the south, it's much more practical to think in terms of taking over significant segments of land and turning them into large commercial estates. Much harder to do up here in the north where the terrain is more rugged. So much of the takeover of land occurs in the southern half of Vietnam. And this will mean also that the loss of control by peasant villages will occur particularly in the south. Less so, although some of it does occur in the north as well. Here, more and more peasants are going to be losing their land. Uh, over half the population then by the 1920s and 30s uh, will be peasants without land, without access to sufficient land. Whereas before the coming of the French, the vast majority of peasants either had land or had access to land of one kind or another. So this is a vast transformation that is taking place, particularly in the south and to a lesser degree in the north. In addition to the development of large commercial rice plantations. The French will also set about establishing uh, rubber plantations. Whereas most of the land that went to rice plantations was land acquired by Vietnamese or even some Chinese of, uh, or Vietnamese of Chinese uh, ethnicity, uh, the rubber plantations, on the other hand, tend to be French enterprises. This is an area where Frenchmen come in directly and develop over a thousand rubber plantations, again, for the purpose of producing rubber for export. These developments have enormous impact upon the Vietnamese people and their reaction towards the French. Aside from issues of nationalism, thousands upon thousands of peasants are losing land. And of course, when you lose land, you lose the village, in essence. You lose the, the core of your social existence. As more and more of these people become simply tenants on large states. And all of this, occurs, of course, is occurring in very rapid uh, order over a series of decades, well, roughly from uh, the 1880s into the 1930s, which are only about a 50-year period where most of this transformation occurs. So this is a factor that deeply radicalizes uh, the Vietnamese peasants. If it might be difficult for mandarins uh, to rally uh, a large part of the peasant population against the French in earlier decades uh, in the name of restoring the dynasty, on the other hand, uh, to rally Vietnamese peasants by the 1930s because of the massive loss of land that they had suffered as a result of French policies. That would be a much easier matter. And indeed, the restlessness uh, of the peasantry because of this massive loss of land becomes a central fuel for revolutionary movements in Vietnam during the 20th century. The other factor, uh, although less widespread, is that many peasants who do lose land uh, are forced into work as laborers on the rubber plantations. And living conditions there are, say the least, atrocious. Some of them, they live in large warehouse-like barracks. Uh, 
uh, their treatment at the hands of the plantation owners and their managers uh, is something less than completely humane. So we have deep-seated resentment over these changes that have occurred in the countryside, but particularly the massive loss of land on the part of the peasants. These were not the only antagonisms uh, that developed between the French and the Vietnamese. In the 1890s, uh, still unsatisfied with the progression of Vietnam towards becoming a self-paying colony, the French set, sent a new governor to Vietnam, a man named Paul Dumer, who oddly enough was a French socialist. I say oddly just because the way he treated the Vietnamese was not very socialistic. His job was really uh, as a business manager, if you will, to make this colony pay for itself. And among the steps that he develops and advances are creation of a salt monopoly. The idea here is that the state will gain revenue by creating a monopoly on the salt, <laughs> the sale of salt. The use of salt in Vietnam is not a matter simply of, it's a nice table condiment, something to throw on your french fries. Uh, salt is vitally important for the preservation of food. And this monopoly inevitably ran inefficiently in trying to secure the maximum profit out of the monopoly of salt, inevitably shortages developed in the countryside uh, over the sale of salt. And what this meant for people is that food that was their basic staple of life uh, would rot because there was not enough salt to preserve the food. So here was another uh, policy by the French colonial power that was deeply antagonistic to the population, that put their very lives at risk uh, because the absence of salt would mean the inability to preserve food and have sufficient food through the year. In addition, Dumer also made an increasing habit of drawing on the peasantry, the local workforce, for public works projects. And this was done essentially free of charge. In other words, you didn't get paid any wages for it. So this use of corvée labor, a term we saw back in the French Revolution, of simply mass uh, drafting of peasants to work on canals or work on railroads, etc., was another issue of deep resentment on the part of the Vietnamese people. So we have a system which under Dumer is becoming more efficient in terms of gaining more revenue and finding ways to get projects done without spending a lot of money, but it's also antagonizing uh, the Vietnamese population ever more greatly. A further problem, but one that was not strictly uh, um, of the French making, was the dominant role that Chinese merchants played in Vietnam's international trade. Remember, I talked about the long history of invasions by the Chinese, occupation, migration, meant that a significant number of uh, people in Vietnam were of Chinese descent. And of course, with this long history up until the time of uh, the coming of the French in the 19th century, uh, Vietnam's trade uh, was largely with China, through China, and therefore it was not surprising that Chinese merchants had come to dominate that trade. That remains true under the French. It's not something that they created, but it was simply convenient for them to take the existing merchant class, at least those involved in international uh, trade, and continue to rely upon them uh, to conduct that kind of trade. But this was a long-standing resentment in Vietnam, and the French do nothing to alter that reality. What it also says is that there are few opportunities for the Vietnamese themselves in terms of their own economy. Peasants are losing land, the Chinese merchants remain uh, in place, and even those who receive uh, a university education in Vietnam are finding it difficult to secure uh, an adequate professional occupation. Now, the French do spend a fair amount of effort educating at least a small elite in Vietnam. This was a common practice not only by the French but by the British and other colonial powers. Uh, colonies are expensive enough as it is. You want at least some of the lesser administrative jobs, for example, provincial administrators. You go, to, go out into the provinces uh, of Vietnam. Uh, you don't want to have to put a French governor in every Vietnamese province. You don't want, and of course each province has a series of districts. You don't want every district director uh, to be a Frenchman. Too expensive. So if you can educate 
a number of Vietnamese, all the way from grade school up through university, you can use those people to handle these lesser administrative posts. And, of course, along the way, much as the idea of a Mandarin class for the dynasty, so too, for the French, you can indoctrinate these people, train them in Western ways, get them to think like Frenchmen, hopefully, and hopefully earn their loyalty as a result of this indoctrination. So there's a method to all of this that the French uh, are engaged in when they get into the business of education for the Vietnamese. And again, it's very restricted. They're not really going to go out and try to educate the peasant population in the countryside. The vast majority of the population will not have access to this. But particularly urban dwellers, people of middle class, upper class, uh, economic and social levels, will be able to gain access, perhaps as far as university. In fact, some Vietnamese uh, actually were sent to the Sorbonne, the leading French university in Paris. And a considerable community of uh, Vietnamese exiles and developed in Paris, people who went to Paris for their education and simply never returned home. But the larger issue here is how much opportunity is there for these people once they are educated? Yes, there are some lesser jobs in the bureaucrat, bureaucratic administration. Uh, they may find jobs as professionals, as doctors and lawyers, but they're not going to occupy the top positions in the bureaucracy. Furthermore, if they are Vietnamese doctors or lawyers, the French want nothing to do with them. They'll have to try to find business among their own people, but they will certainly will not be uh, called upon by the French uh, to play a similar role. What we have in the end is a large number of highly educated people for whom there are few, if any, economic opportunities. You know, Chinese control international trade, the French dominate the military and the bureaucracy in general, the educational system. Where does one find opportunity? So you create what turns out to be a fairly volatile social class, essentially of middle class, to some degree upper class, particularly middle class descendants with university education, but little opportunity. So this becomes another volatile group within Vietnamese society, along with the peasants who have so long resented uh, their loss of land and their exploitation in places like the rubber plantations. This unrest begins to find new avenues of outlet at the beginning of the 20th century. You remember the Mandarins were unsuccessful in their effort to rouse a successful rebellion against the French, in part because their appeal to the peasantry was not very wholehearted and because what they were asking for was the restoration of a dynasty which had already essentially capitulated to the French. Other appeals might prove to be far more popular. And one of the people who starts to make those appeals is this man, Phan Boi Chao. He was himself a Mandarin had been educated in the old system. But he became convinced that to unseat the French, what Vietnam must do is modernize itself. It must focus its rebellion on ousting the French for the purpose of creating a modern nation. No more talk of you know, dynastic restoration. That simply wasn't going to happen. That did not have broad popular appeal. And in fact, you know, there is this puppet emperor that continues uh, to allegedly rule France, I mean, rule France, rule Vietnam. But of course, it's at uh, the behest of the French. The French are running the show. The emperor is just there you know, to be hauled out in public to show that, oh yes, there is still Vietnamese participation in their own governance because they have their own emperor. So this kind of appeal to dynastic loyalties is hopeless at the beginning of the 20th century. So he is among those who begin to propagate the idea not only of rebellion against the French, but of rebellion designed to oust the French and create an independent nation state and a modern nation. He argues that indeed we have to abandon uh, the uh, 
reliance upon uh, classical education and the Confucian texts. We have to surrender these aspects uh, of our past because they're no longer efficient. We have to organize a modern society, better educated, more technologically oriented. We have to accept the ideas of a modern nation state with a secular government, no more talk of a monarchy, an empire, a dynasty. We have to modernize for the purpose of getting rid of the French. Okay. That has to be our appeal. So this is a dramatic shift, and he really he can be considered the first modern nationalist in Vietnam. And indeed, he influences a number of different groups who will challenge the French in the years ahead and will use his ideas as a basis for their own movements. This is a turning point for Vietnam, and it's important to think about some of his ideas because they really become an important part of the eventual uh, rebellion under Ho Chi Minh, the rebellion by the communists, because the communists in many ways are making essentially the same argument, that now what we are doing, we want an end to French rule, and we can only do that by adopting Western ways, Western technologies, and of course what we want to create in the long run is a modern nation state and a modernized, economically developed nation. So many of his ideas have significant influence upon the communists, as we will see. It is not all uh, a matter of ideology that they adopted or secured from um, Karl Marx. In fact, much of it is homegrown. Much of it comes from this man, Fan Boy Chao. It is in 1904 that he creates uh, the Modernization Society. Now, it's kind of bland <laughs> title uh, for a group whose ultimate purpose in the mind uh, of Fan Boy Chao was to create an armed rebellion against the French. But of course, if you're going to go around propagating armed rebellion, you're not going to stay out of jail very long uh, with the French in power. So this is an issue uh, of essentially choosing a name and focusing on some issues that at least in public uh, could be safely discussed about the need to modernize. Because, again, many of the uh, older members of uh, the Mandarin class, those who had fought the earlier battles, and many people in Vietnam still believe that in being anti-French, uh, that meant restoring the traditional Vietnam, going back to the ways of the past, maintaining one's reliance upon uh, Confucian education, etc. Uh, and this is the opposite of what he is trying to propagate. Uh, he's trying to tell people that the idea of uh, using the classical system and going back to the traditional ways is simply will never manage to oust the French from power. It is not surprising that he will use the Modernization Society to build an alliance with the Chinese nationalists. Remember, in China, this is the time, this is after the turn of the century, the, remember the uh, dynasty will fall in 1911, uh, and it is the Chinese nationalists, the Kuomintang and the Sun Yat-sen, who will rise to power there. At this time, in the years leading up to the collapse of the dynasty, these two movements, the Kuomintang and the Modernization Society, have a lot in common in terms of their ideas. Sun Yat-sen has many of the same ideas uh, about modernizing China, about throwing off foreign rule, although China is not technically a colony uh, of any Western power. So there is a great deal of empathy between the two sides uh, about these issues. What about the question of the long-standing antagonisms between China and Vietnam? Well, those can be put aside at this time because, of course, China itself is tottering on the brink of chaos. So the idea that China is any kind of immediate threat uh, to Vietnam is simply out of the question, although the issue will come up again, as we will see later on. Is China really an ally and friend of Vietnam, or is it trying to dominate Vietnam? But at this time, at least, uh, Fan Boy Chao and his supporters often operate in uh, southern parts of China where the Kuomintang has influence, particularly after the revolution uh, in 19, well, if you can even call it a revolution, but the collapse of the dynasty in 1911. Uh, on many occasions, he will have to leave Vietnam and his supporters will have to leave Vietnam and they will go to southern China, uh, a place where they can operate, where they can recruit followers, and where they enjoy uh, a fairly positive response from the Chinese nationalists who see them as brethren in terms of like-mindedness about the need to end foreign domination and modernize their societies. 
Now, of course, much of uh, what Phan Boi Chao does is focused in Vietnam itself. Uh, what he wants to do is make this a popular movement with massive support. And to do that, he needs to win over not only uh, intellectuals, but also local administrators, the provincial administrators who have uh, their uh, hands on the local population are able to influence the local population. And one of the people he turns to is a fairly low-level provincial administrator, a man named Win Sin Sak. He was one of the sort of classic middle-class Vietnamese who had been trained as a bureaucrat to operate within the French system. Did not necessarily mean he gave his complete support to it. And because of this, Phan Boi Chao visits him at one point uh, to try to convince him uh, to join the side of the Modernization Society. At that time, when he visits, uh, he meets Win's son, uh, a man named Win Tat Than. And he tries to convince Win Tat Than that he too should join the Modernization Society. However, Win Tat Than is less than enthusiastic about this at this time. He feels that in some ways Phan Boi Chao is not even radical enough in terms of his goals. Uh, the two men will meet again, as we will see, uh, some years later in the 1920s. And the significance of their encounters, both at this time and later on, we'll see as we see the evolution of the Vietnamese Revolution. But keep in mind this man, Win Tat Than, and his early encounter with Phan Boi Chao. And both of them do share concerns about asserting Chinese and Vietnamese nationalism and throwing off French rule, but they also differ in terms of how is that to be accomplished. They will meet again, and their ideas have profound effects upon Vietnam. Now, looking at what we've examined so far uh, in the historical background uh, of Vietnam, first of all, although it's difficult to call what we saw in the early centuries uh, Vietnamese nationalism, because really, uh, when you talk of a nation state, it's really not until Phan Boi Chao that uh, Vietnamese are talking about creating a nation state. But we can loosely call this nationalism that exists in Vietnam all the way back uh, to the early creation of Nam Viet, uh, all the way back to 200 BC, in the sense of the Vietnamese people having their belief that they exist as a common people, that they have the right to assert an independent society of their own. Although at this time and down through the centuries into the 19th century, that common identity and that society is to be focused on a dyna dynastic system. And we saw that dynastic system created with some success by the Lur dynasty. And then later on, uh, the rise of the Win dynasty. Throughout this period, the commonality throughout Vietnam's history, even as there are dynastic struggles between North and South, and even as Vietnam faces a series of uh, Chinese invasions and occupations, is this insistence on the right of Vietnam and the Vietnamese people to form and shape their own society independently of foreign domination. This is critical to understanding the events that unfold uh, in Vietnam in the 1920s and 30s that we're going to be looking at in a few minutes. Without that perception, it is difficult to appreciate the essential quality of what happens in Vietnam, what kind of revolution this exactly is. Perhaps in no other society uh, that we've looked at in terms of revolutionary motivation uh, has the sense of national identity played such an important role. It's been significant elsewhere, there's no question that uh, people like uh, Lenin, people like Mao, people like Fidel Castro are all nationalists uh, to one degree or another. But the extent to which people have this common sense of identity, uh, one that stretches back some 2,000 years before the revolution, this is really unique to Vietnam. The second legacy that is so essential to understanding what happens uh, in Vietnam, and that come on, comes out of Vietnam's long history, is this issue of the peasant village. The peasant village as this communal social unit with strong bonds among its members, in part economically based, 
because of the communal aspect of landholding. Strongly based spiritually because of this belief in guiding spirits and ancestor worship and the belief that indeed the village is the residing place of the spirits of one's ancestors. The uh, guidance of the village by its elders and especially the, call it, uniquely independent status of Vietnamese villages in regards to the rule of the elite and of a series of dynasties. Here is a situation where essentially it can be said and was said in Vietnam that well the, the emperor rules outside the village but inside the village the village elders rule. In fact because villages control their own land and largely have to pay tribute to landowners and to the dynasty there is a great deal of fact in this that gives them considerably more leeway and power than they would have if, like many Chinese peasants, they had simply been reduced to tenants on the estates of the great landowners. This is a situation where they have far more economic power, where there is this long tradition and history of independence in dealing with landlords and emperors. It's not to say that these people weren't subordinated, but they had far more ability to impact their environment, to influence the political process than did peasants in other societies. This needs to be kept in mind when we look at the unfolding of the revolution in the second half because this is powerful force waiting to be tapped um, by revolutionary forces. If you can capture the interest and the commitment of the peasantry, uh, these villages are a powerful means of building support and indeed that's precisely what the communists will do in their march to victory. At the same time, there are legacies on the part of the French. Things that their colonial rule, as relatively brief as it was, because we can say, you know, even if we take it from the invasion of Saigon, which is not the assertion of full control, that's 1861, and by 1954, French rule will be over. But even in that short period, they had tremendous impact upon Vietnam, both in terms of what they did to existing institutions and relationships in Vietnam and the new types of uh, institutions and relationships that they tried to create during their time of rule. The first one is of course the issue of landlessness. As the French go about creating an agricultural export economy, especially in the south, they devastate peasant villages. They take a society in which again the vast majority of people in the countryside had some access to land, if not outright ownership, uh, to a situation where most of them, particularly in the South, no longer have that. You can only imagine, we can only imagine, just how drastic this change was and just how much antagonism was created between the peasant population and French rule, taking on this seemingly independent set of village units and depriving them of land, and if not all of their land, then substantial portions of it and impoverishing them. At the same time, beyond what happens in the countryside, there is the reality of what happens to the middle class. Yes, educational opportunities are created for them, even university education. But in the end, economic opportunities remain woefully limited. You have created a series of expectations with education that the French never intend on fulfilling. Foreign trade is dominated by Chinese merchants, bureaucracy, the military, dominated by the French themselves. So you have an increasingly discontented middle class who feel that there is little opportunity for them to shape their own society. Finally, there are regional differences that exist in Vietnam. The south, where the French began their efforts at missionary work, has more Christians, more Catholics than the north. We'll see this becomes an issue, uh, particularly after 1954. But even more important than that is the fact that it is the South where there has been this massive loss of land. We will see exactly what the implications are. We know that that's going to cause antagonism. But another thing to think about is that because of the loss of land, the village structures in the South are weakened. They are less able to resist than villages in the North. The place where the communists will be able to build their strength 
is in the northern half of Vietnam initially, not entirely, but more so than in the south. Why? Because the villages in the south have suffered such disorganization with the loss of land. It is initially in the north where more village structures have survived that the communists can first build their base of support. So with Vietnam, what we're going to see are two converging factors, or really three. One, anti-colonialism, reaction against foreign domination by the French. Two, this long history of nationalism. And three, an expression of deep-seated social and economic discontents by both the peasants and the middle class. We'll see in a few minutes how those forces converged to create the Vietnamese Revolution.